My Steam code for Pacific Drive was provided for review purposes by Ironwood Studios and Kepler Interactive. I have not been paid to make this video, nor am I really technically under any obligation to make it. What's more, the only restrictions on what I can say were related to the release embargo, which has long since passed, and a request to not spoil anything beyond a specific mid-game event. I am otherwise free to say whatever I wish. With that out of the way, on to the video proper. As anyone who's been subscribed to this channel for any amount of time will certainly already know, I am an enormous fan of driving games. Not just racing, but instead anything that asks you to use a vehicle in interesting ways, or has really great mechanics surrounding the vehicles in said game. I'm also really into more granular simulation style games. The stuff that asks you to play with the minutia of an experience that games usually gloss over. So I was interested in Pacific Drive from the moment I saw it. I enjoy games like Road to Guangdong, and I adore Jalopy. Pacific Drive seems to be aiming to answer the question, what if you took a game like Jalopy and put the player in less restrictive, more sci-fi environments that almost lean more to a post-apocalyptic side? Mechanically, the core goals in Pacific Drive focus on taking care of and upgrading your car by gathering resources in moderately sized zones and then taking them back to your garage. There are a lot of survival mechanics at play you've likely seen before, though that isn't a bad thing. The reason for that is that it's survival done right, with a focus on what makes it interesting for this game instead of filling an arbitrary checklist. There's a wealth of different zone types, enemies and obstacles, resources, parts on your car that need managed, and upgrades that allow you to push deeper and deeper into the Olympic exclusion zone as a whole. And they rarely feel like they're in the way of progress, so much as goals that make you feel more prepared to take larger risks. It feels organic. Your car is known as a remnant, an object that has been affected by the zone and the studies on limb technology that created it, which once it attaches to someone, that person supposedly becomes more and more steadily obsessed with it until it takes over every one of their thoughts. Beyond your car, you'll have a few allies along the way, but they don't always get along as well as you might hope, meaning it's up to you to accomplish the tasks that are required in order to meet your goals. As you play, you'll find more challenging obstacles, more options to equip your vehicle, garage, and character with, and more ridiculous environments. But what's more, you'll have more you need to contend with in the process, since parts on your car not only have life, but also a lifespan. Eventually, you'll have to replace things when they simply get too worn, and your car can even develop quirks that you need to diagnose in order to fix them. Some quirks are not too big of a deal, a minor annoyance. Others can be just as debilitating as getting a flat tire or your windshield being destroyed. We'll talk a bit more about all this later though. Thankfully, for the most part, the game itself is really allowed to shine, at least on PC. I can't speak for other platforms. It did initially default to running on my integrated CPU graphics, which wasn't fantastic, but is an easy fix. Especially if you're on a laptop, that's basically always one of the first things worth checking. Though in my case, it didn't run super bad either way. It just ran far better on my GPU proper. And it's possible that had I gotten my NVIDIA game ready drivers before playing initially, it would have seen the game immediately. I only had the game crash once across all of the footage I captured, which was nice. And thankfully, it was right after moving between areas, so the game had just saved and I'd lost no progress. That being said, I believe like many Unreal games, there's an issue with shader compilation stutter. During my first play session, there was a wealth of stutters, but these stutters became less frequent across my second play session. However, there was a major update before my third time playing and those stutters once again kicked up in full force, before dissipating once again. My main issue with shader comp stutter, if that is indeed what this is, is that it makes diagnosing performance issues to dial in settings extra tedious. It's not the worst problem in the world, but I wish I could choose to go into the settings and activate a pre-comp step. Even if I have to leave the game to its own devices for 10 minutes or whatever. It's not the end of the world, but I figured it was worth mentioning. 
once I got everything figured out, I could run the game pretty stable at DLSS quality, 1440p, 60 frames a second with medium high settings, other than the settings for the car's side mirror, which I lowered. Unfortunately, OBS didn't really seem to like Pacific Drive, so most of my footage is instead at 1080p DLSS balanced settings. Usually it doesn't have that much of an impact when I capture footage, but it did here. Pacific Drive starts just a bit rough in general. It simultaneously feels slightly overwhelming and also a little boringly simple. The complexity caused me to miss things for a while, like the multiple tabs in the fabricator, how the tinker station worked, or that energy from the orbs you pick up as you explore is a required resource for fabrication. At first I thought they were just needed to create an exit portal. It's not that these things aren't tutorialized well, so much as that it was a lot to take in. That didn't combine well with the fact that for the first few hours, my lack of understanding of the game kind of led to the gameplay feeling too repetitive and simple. For a while, the core gameplay loop felt really basic, repetitive, and both it and progression felt slow. But part of that was undoubtedly down to how overwhelmed I was. Once you catch your stride though, it's rewarding, richly varied, challenging, and engaging. That isn't to say that there aren't some things that are a bit clunky in terms of conveyance. I still don't know how to use transmuters, for example, since it only lets me put in the object that you would assume it should take in and then convert into the other resource to the right of the arrow in the UI. Transmuters seem like they're supposed to turn one object into another. But it always just dropped the same object I put in back at my feet, and while the logbook is fantastic in many ways, and often really witty, it sometimes feels like it isn't interested in telling you what you need to know. All that being said, most of my problems were either fleeting or so minor that I hardly felt them. Everything else was fantastic. The core loop of Pacific Drive sees you preparing in your garage and then choosing an end location for another trip into the exclusion zone. You then venture out and try to keep yourself and your car alive in a hostile but mostly uncaring environment, collecting enough resources to upgrade things back at the base and push that little bit further next time. The more places you explore and successfully make it back from, the further out you can go. And along that journey, you'll also unlock highways that allow you to skip junctions. If you don't have or don't use a highway, you'll have to stop at every location along the road you're traveling. Good for resources, but it does mean you're spending more time out in the wild, risking that something serious goes wrong. You can drive straight through junctions on the way to your destination, but that technically means the area was solely a resource drain, however minor. This creates a feedback loop that asks you to repeatedly strategize on the fly based on what challenges and resource opportunities you come face to face with. The more you explore, the more types of obstacles, environments, and resources you'll find. That includes things like visual customizations for your vehicle, logbook entries, and conversations with the three characters trying to assist you so that you'll hopefully assist them in return. And therefore, the more you explore, the more of the story of the Olympic Exclusion Zone you'll uncover. Your car is your everything here. Thankfully, the people at Ironwood Studios know the power of the station wagon, so instead of pushing a stinky Jeep knockoff or SUV or faux useful modern truck on you, you get a once wood paneled masterpiece of a vehicle that's perfect for your needs, and probably still smells like your grandpa's cologne in an old ashtray. As long as you treat this vehicle with the respect it shows you, it'll do what you need it to do and it'll do it well. The handling is fantastic, as are the physics of the game in general. The car is really weighty, with solid grip on surfaces your tire type is currently made for, and a genuinely meaningful lack of grip when they're mismatched or it's raining or you need to make a sudden emergency heading correction. While it doesn't feel the same, this channels the gritty, difficult nature of driving that people rave about to this day in Grand Theft Auto 4. There are games that aren't trying to be simulators or anything like that, but still have a handling model with heft and a nuance that gives the impression of realism, texture, and natural unpredictability in the wrong hands. As I said, Treat your car with respect, and it'll do the same for you. There are a lot of aspects to this that need to be kept in mind. Your car has a limited amount of battery and fuel, so you'll need to find or make ways to ensure that they never run out in the middle of nowhere. 
you need to remember to turn off big battery drains like your headlights when you go exploring on foot. Remember to put your car in park before you go gallivanting into the woods as well. There are also a wealth of core parts to your car that you need to maintain, from your engine, to each door and panel, to the wheels and tires, and even additional racks you put on the outside as you unlock upgrades. There are also different types of parts for different purposes, more powerful engines that take more fuel, or even one that's electric so you'll use your battery instead, armored panels or panels that take less electric damage, etc. There are also abilities that you can equip in the four face button slots, from a handbrake button to an ability that heals you whenever you press it by using a sizable chunk of the car's battery charge. These parts wear as they make contact with the environment or hostile anomalies, as well as just from general use. Sometimes they'll take specific types of damage. A wheel might get loose and need tightened. The tire might be popped and need sealed, or it might blow out entirely and just need replaced. A headlight might short out, or a window might crack. All of these more unique mechanical problems come with their own effects that make travel more difficult. It's not just a bar that depletes until you heal it. And eventually, every part will reach a point where it won't effectively repair anymore, and you simply need to choose to replace it. This leads to interesting choices as you explore. Do you take up precious space with a tool to fix each potential problem? Just the ones that you think are most likely on this specific adventure? The most debilitating ones? Or do you just hope you can find the resources to make the tool out in the wild? You can also find special parts that offer some sort of benefit, but cannot be repaired. And this system of degradation and repairs affects the previously mentioned battery and fuel systems. You might end up with an issue that drastically drains your battery, or a fuel leak. Or you might even end up finding an anomaly that will recharge your battery at the cost of some damage and a temporarily electrically charged part that will damage you if you touch it. The car can even develop quirks, which are very specific cause and effect style problems. There seem to be thousands of different combinations of varying levels of seriousness. These can include everything from the windshield wipers getting stuck whenever the car battery is low, to the car lurching forward every time you briefly tap the gas or even the car using an ability every time you turn the headlights on. In my case, the car decided to spam the aforementioned ability that sapped my battery to heal me. I thankfully figured it out right as I made my way back to the garage, making it an easy fix. But out in the wild, that would have been a nightmare. The only way to deal with quirks is to first properly diagnose the cause and effect. When you do so, you can then repair it. This was one of my favorite parts of the whole game because it's an endless sea of diverse issues to overcome that don't come free to fix. You have eight guesses per visit to the garage to diagnose a quirk. If you fail, you'd better hope you can live with it for one more adventure. Upgrades can thankfully hone in on the more standard problems you might have. Find yourself regularly running out of fuel or battery? Strap extras to your vehicle on the side windows or the back seat. Feel like you need more lights on your car? Slap them on. Don't want flat tires anymore, or maybe want tires that are better for off-road? Work toward improvements there in the upgrade tree, though you often have to make a choice between one type of part or another. It's rare that you can have everything you want, which is a smart design choice. You can even upgrade your storage space, and the storage has actual shapes to it that channel a bit of Resident Evil 4's attache case micromanagement. And you can even upgrade your character to make them a bit more resilient, as well as upgrade the garage to keep pushing toward a stronger vehicle that allows you to go deeper into the zone. This is good because the challenges you'll face are just as diverse. Sure, you don't want to be smashing into buildings or trees, and rough terrain requires skilled driving, but what'll really keep you on your toes are the anomalies. Not all of these are actively hostile. In fact, most aren't, even if they're still dangerous. Bunnies are little spiky balls that chase your car and come in several different forms, from ones that just do basic damage, to electrified ones, and more. There's even a type that heals anything nearby, which you'll want to throw on your car for an easier journey. There are storms of intense wind that will literally throw your car around, abductors that grab your vehicle when they see it and then race around until it smashes the car into a tree or whatever, or maybe into other anomalies. Some anomalies just activate bits of your car unprompted, or shock it, or irradiate you and damage parts, or steal parts off your car and try to run away. 
Tourist anomalies are one of the first you'll find, and they're literally just mannequins that usually appear in groups. Sometimes they'll throw electricity between each other. Often, they'll explode. And I swear that sometimes tourist anomalies will pull a Resident Evil 7 beginning hour and move when you look away and then look back. And that's beyond the fact that they will spawn out of nowhere when you're simply looking around sometimes. As you go, anomalies only get weirder, more creative, and often more dangerous. And again, thankfully, not all of them are dangerous. Sometimes I just had things sort of fall from the sky as if the zone was feeling charitable. You can find bubble anomalies sometimes dragging really good items around. The golden nugget speed boosters can be helpful if used right. And the friendly dumpster rivals companion cube for inanimate object affection, but without the necessity that you eventually murder them just to catalog whether or not you felt something. Friendly dumpster is best buddy. Junctions themselves also come with a wealth of modifiers, from heavy winds, to intense otherworldly darkness, to an abundance of certain types of anomalies, and sometimes the modifiers make the storm start closing in on you near immediately, meaning you basically just have to book it straight to the exit if you want to survive for long. Because yes, you are limited in the amount of time you can explore before a junction gets too dangerous to survive in, denoted by a ring collapsing on the area like in a battle royale. Though usually you have a lot of time in each area. Anyway, similar to quirks, these modifiers and the variety of anomalies really elevate the game in a way that can't be put into words. For me, it's stuff like this that makes the game as a whole. While I'm choosing not to say much about the story to avoid spoilers, and I'm also not showing the later parts of the game, believe me when I say that it gets interesting. Random forests with dirt roads and campgrounds in them are just the beginning. Things can really easily and unexpectedly end up heavily in your favor when you're out and about, or they can absolutely hit the fan, which adds so much memorability to overarching trips. The more the game throws at you, the further you get from the early repetitive lulls. When you are just barely hanging on by a thread, it really, really does feel like an uphill battle, but it never feels out of reach to survive if you just play carefully. Likewise, no matter how great a run is going, that one dumb mistake can always lead to chaos and catastrophe. And failure is punishing since you lose everything you gathered, your car is going to be in bad shape, and you lost all the time you spent in the zone. Dare I say, it's almost like the Dark Souls of Survival Games. The friendly dumpster is always there to help though, and often knows what you need to get going again when you come back in rough shape. This game also spins narrative through gameplay like a Souls game, just as much as it does through conversations with characters and audio and text logs. The Olympic Exclusion Zone feels like a character unto itself. The story itself is really rewarding, and the writing is excellent. The characters are richly detailed and have great, intentional rough chemistry. They also don't over talk and most of what they'll say, they say only once, so you're not spammed with the same few lines over and over again. I wasn't expecting to pay much attention to the story here, since it's not really what I was coming to the game for, but it wasn't long before I really wanted to know more. And the balance between these people being companions and being a hindrance because of their different opinions and bickering is excellently done. The music is equally great. But both the original stuff and the choices they made for the licensed tracks. Same with the sound design and aesthetics in general, this is a beautiful game that crafts a wonderfully addictive level of both intrigue and loneliness. And it doesn't hurt that the animations for things like the mechanics kit or repair putty are adorably colorful and stylized. The general pacing, UI and UX, and game feel are also phenomenal. Garage Time is a truly wonderful pacing break that lets you wind down and then gets you recharged and ready to take on another journey, both literally and emotionally. There's no time limit on it, so you can just chill and listen to some tunes while zoning out into busy work while you prepare for your next dive into the deep waters of the unknown. On top of everything else, the accessibility options on offer 
Turn Pacific Drive are ridiculously great and really allow you as the player to tailor the experience to how you want to play. If there's an aspect of the game that you find particularly tedious, there's a good chance you can streamline it or even deactivate it, and yet I don't think these changes would inherently make the game less interesting. Since Pacific Drive doesn't have to be about difficulty or mechanical tedium in order to be engaging. It's all about what, if anything, you specifically want to hone in on. Honestly, I could just keep talking about this game for ages. I've barely scratched the surface of why it was so enjoyable to sink so much time into, but I don't even really know where to start, honestly. Either way, I'm absolutely going to go back to this game over and over again. Not only because it's beautiful and the core loop is masterful, but also because it'll never be the same journey twice. It's definitely not the perfect game or anything, but it is a unique offering that you absolutely shouldn't miss if it sounds even vaguely interesting to you. Oh.